are once again requested before we start the majlis to recite the ayah of Shafa for the quick recovery. I'm told that there are two ladies in our community who are extremely sick. There are also many other people that I have been approached about who are either undergoing a medical procedure or they are also suffering from some sort of an illness or if they have family members around the world who are also suffering from some sort of an illness who have a problem. So I ask that we join together with the wasila of our fourth holy Imam, Imam Sajjad Salawatullahi wa Salaamu that recite the ayah of Shafa for the quick recovery of these people. And we also pray for all those people who are the, under the oppression of tyrants across the world. We pray also for those people who are in difficulties, especially in the lands of Iraq and in the lands of Syria and the refugee crisis that is currently going on. We pray for all of them with the ayah of Shafa five times, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-mustarra iza da'ahu wa yakshifu su. 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 أما يجيب المستر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء بر محمد وآل محمد صلوات. I've also been asked to make this announcement that the Ishnashri Union Literacy Section presents a talk entitled Karbala in the 21st Century, and this will be tomorrow night for the youths. Uh, inshallah, if Allah gives me life, I'll be giving that talk. But I want to warn the members who come that it is not going to be a monologue. It will be an interactive session. So you want to become prepared to give your opinions so that I can learn as well as you, inshallah. We learn from each other. It's going to be after the program here um, at the mosque or at Mehfil Abbas. I think the location is yet to be determined. But you will be able to, you will be told about it with uh, probably, I think, a WhatsApp or message that goes uh, from the community, inshallah. So you will be informed about it. So if you can come, inshallah, we will have an opportunity to interact with each other. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع المذنبين وخاتم النبيين نبينا وشفينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإليك يا رب نسبت وجهي وإليك يا رب مددت يدي فبعزتك استجب لدعائي وبلغني مناية ولا تقطع من فضلك رجائي وقفني شر الجن والإنس من عدائي يا سريع الرضا اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا الدعاء فإنك فعال لما تشاء يا من اسمه دواء وذكره شفاء وطاعته غنى ارحم من رعس ماله الرجاء وسلاؤه البقاء يا صابغ النعم يا دافع النقم يا نور المستوحشين في الظلم يا علم لا يعلم صل على محمد وآل محمد وافعل بما تهلو 
وصلى الله على رسوله وعلى عيمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وهو أصدق الصادقين وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب ننزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى سرات العزيز الحميد آمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات بالله محمد وآل محمد أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمسابنا بأبا عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Respected scholars, elders of the community, my brothers and sisters in Islam سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Yesterday we started the topic that the theme of these lectures on the ethical and spiritual dimension of Karbala and we mentioned as an introduction that the human being has four major relationships the first relationship being his most important goal in his life and the purpose of his creation being his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that indeed is his goal in life is to strengthen that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he can gain proximity and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for that he has to engage in three other relationships, the relationship with his inner self, the relationship with the environment, and the relationship with society, with other human beings, with his family and his friends and others, other human beings. And we said that in order to strengthen these three relationships, he has to undergo a process of purification. He has to purify his nafs in order to perfect his relationship with himself and his inner self. He has to purify his aql or his intellect in order to perfect his relationship with the environment or with the universe. And he has to purify his akhlaq, his moral and ethical behavior in order to perfect his relationship with society, with his family and his friends. And as he goes through these perfections and he starts to perfect himself in this domain, he starts to unfold spiritual realities, he starts to develop spiritually, he starts to unfold and unveil himself between himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He breaks those shackles that are grounding him to this dunya and to this world and he ascends towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first stage of which is an apparent stage of Islam where he has just made himself a Muslim. He just has knowledge of Allah but he has no understanding of Allah. He purifies himself and he ascends further and he reaches the stage of Iman, a stage where he now has ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has some understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His heart is now at play, but he purifies himself even more. He then ascends to the level of taqwa, where now he has the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mind. He feels the presence of Allah and in doing so, he now refrains from any act in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he not he does not neglect any act that is in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But then he purifies in, in himself even more until he reaches that stage of yakin, the stage of conviction The stage of stir certitude where he becomes dissolved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In such a way that now everything he does it is an automatic reaction Everything he does he is in line with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It becomes a state in his heart he has conviction and he has certitude and yesterday we started our discussion on that first stage of purification which is the purification of nafs and we said how we learn from Karbala that how one purifies his nafs that the purpose and the mission of Aba Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi is to take people from darkness, from the depths of darkness, into the bliss of enlightenment. Taking them, taking them from zulumat to nur, 
from darkness to enlightenment. And that is the mission of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. That is the message of Karbala. And we stated that in order for him to do that, there has to be a certain potential. There has to be a certain capacity within the human being. There has to be a certain level of moral and ethics within that human being for Aba Abdullah to take you from zulumat to nur. And we said that even the Quran says that if you do not have that basic level of morality and ethics within yourself, then even the Quran cannot be a guidance for you. And so for that, we need to purify our nafs in becoming human beings first before you even look for spiritual elevation. You know, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, you know, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, you know, he, uh, he has many areas in the Quran where he has spoken, <coughs> he has spoken about the fact that if the human being creates a level of khair, a level of goodness within himself, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will enlighten that human being. Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli. He talks about this. He says that as long as the human being creates a level of goodness, ethics, and morality within himself, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who will enlighten him. And then he says, he says that there are three categories of people. Eh? Because of their worldly desires, because of their base animalistic desires that they have, and because of the immorality that they have within themselves, because of their immoral and unethical behavior that they have, they are not able to even see the truth. And if they are able to see the truth, they are not able to even follow the truth. And sometimes they are not able to even distinguish what is good and what is right and what is wrong. He talks about three categories of people. And these three categories of people were present in the army of Yazid. Our job now is to see who those three categories of people are that Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli talks about and whether we have any reflections of those three categories of people within ourselves. And if we do, then we will talk about, inshallah, in the next few nights, how we can move from darkness to light and how we can use Aba Abdullah and the sacrifice of Karbala to move from darkness into light. These three categories of people, the first category he describes, these are the people that when the truth is said to them, when they are presented with the truth, what they do is they just close their eyes and they close their ears. And this used to happen in the day of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah? You know, when the prophet, when he announced his prophethood and when he started to give the message of Islam, then the people were told that, oh, don't listen to this man. Just close your eyes and close your ears. And some of them were asked even play drums or play some music or read something or chant some poetry really loudly. So the voice of Muhammad would not fall into your ears. We do the same, eh? See, we think that we can plead ignorance. So sometimes we think to ourselves that, Mana, if I don't know about it, then I won't be responsible. It's very easy, Mana. You know, it's really very, very simple. Koi kai boltu hoi, din vishe. Koi kai lecture de tu hoi, din vishe. Koi kai chene de din na vishe, ke jena vishe kai boltu hoi, to hun jo nai sambru. So, I will ask you to ask me to ask you to ask See, we think we can plead ignorance by closing our eyes and closing our ears. That's one group of people. And that is because we have immorality in our hearts. We have immoral and unethical behavior in our hearts. Our hearts are polluted. That's why we think that way. The second group of people are those people that hear the truth, that understand the truth, but they decide that they are not going to follow it. Why? 
because they are too attached to the animalistic based desires that they have. Because the truth contradicts what they really want as far as the dunya is concerned. The base desires of this world are such that the truth contradicts with it. So they understand it, they know it, but they don't follow it. But then Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli says, the worst group is the third group. These two groups, they still have hope. But the worst group is this third group. It is the most dangerous group. This is the group that hears the truth, but has now lost the ability to distinguish good from evil. They have lost the ability to distinguish what is right from what is wrong. They don't know. This is the group for which salvation is difficult. It's very difficult. When you have lost that ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, that becomes very difficult. And that is as a result of the immorality and immoral behaviors that we have. You know, we have to evaluate ourselves eh? that in this continuum of these three groups, where do we lie in that continuum? Where are we? You know, the goal, as I said, is to gain proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the nights, eh, the nights of Muharram. These are the nights when you can get incredible proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has blessed us with this night. And he says, you just take the journey. Just start. Because in order for you to take the journey, you need courage. Have that courage to start, at least start the journey, make a commitment on this night. Make a commitment to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a journey, right? A journey that a lover has for his beloved. A journey that a lover has for his beloved. This is like the example, so see, if you read Indian poetry, right? If you read Sher, Sher Shairi, and don't get me started on that, because if I start on that, then the whole majlis will be on Sher Shairi. But if you read Indian Sher Shairi, then the example of the lover going to the beloved commonly is given the example of the parwana going to the shamma. Yeah? The parwana for the youth, you know, the parwana is that moth that is attracted to the candlelight, you know, the flame at the end of the candlelight. That's called the shamma. The parwana is the moth, and it gets attracted to it. And the Hindu, the, the Indian shairi talks about this as true love. The love of the parwana going to the shamma. And then as it gets to the shamma, it's so much in love with the shamma that it gets annihilated in the shamma. It gets destroyed, it dies. What's better lover than the parwana? But the reality is, this is not true love. This is not true love. Because this is a blind love. The parwana has no ma'rifa of the shamma. He does not have any understanding or knowledge of the shamma. And that is why it goes towards the nur, and the nur becomes nar for the parwana. True love is that love that when you go towards your beloved, you acquire something from the beloved. He takes you from darkness to light. The true love is that love that when you go close to the beloved, you start to reflect and manifest the attributes of your beloved inside yourself. That is true love. This parwana is crazy, boy. He doesn't know what he's doing. He has no marifa. He's just blind. Islam wants you to have true love. The lover going towards the beloved. This is the message of this particular nights of Muharram. You know, you have to start the journey. The journey has to be start so that Allah can take you from zulumat to nur, to enlightenment. This is the journey. 
you know, the destination of this journey is Allah, meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a physical meeting, eh? This is a metaphysical meeting. This is a spiritual meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the means towards getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this journey is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. This is the means of getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the question we ask on these nights of Muharram is who is going to ask for Allah from Allah? It's a deep statement man, that I made. Who is going to ask for Allah? Who is going to desire Allah from Allah? That's the question. You see, if I ask you, what do you desire in the hereafter? Then most of us will say, I want Jannah. Yeah? When Jannah is not bad, eh? it's a good thing. It's a good thing to desire. Right? What do you want in the hereafter? I want to go to Jannah. We have this concept of Jannat in our mind. Eh? You know, there will be rivers of milk and honey and big palaces and beautiful fruits and huris and everything. We have made this concept. It has been described as such because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this particular creation of mine is a victim of his mind. So I need to describe it to him so he can relate to it. But let me ask you a question. What is Jannah? What is Jannah? Is Jannah not a creation of God? Is it not a creation of Allah? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So Jannah is a creation of Allah. Who are we? We are also a creation of Allah, are we not? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ This human being, he is the best of my creation. So I ask you a question, if you are the best of Allah's creation, and Jannah is also a creation of Allah, then Jannah is a lesser creation than the human being. Tell me, how can a human being who is more superior uh, desire for something that is lesser than him? The point is, we don't want Jannah. We don't want another creation of Allah. We want the Creator Himself. Desire Allah from Allah. That is the true Jannah. Jannah has levels. Eh? These levels that you are talking about with you know, palaces and rivers is the lowest level. Papa, I don't want to be there. I want to be there where I can have the most proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is my true heaven. That is my true heaven. Think of a journey that you're going to take. Eh? You're going to go from Dar es Salaam to Morogoro. It's about a hundred miles I'm talking. About a hundred miles from Dar es Salaam to Morogoro. Now I tell you that you need to get to Morogoro in 30 minutes. I want you to get to Morogoro from Dar es Salaam in 30 minutes. So it's about 100 miles. So now you need a car that is going to be able to, to, to do 200 miles an hour, right? That car is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. You want to journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to go towards the proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need a vehicle to take you to where you are and ascend you to the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that you need a fast car and that car is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Take the journey. These are nights where we make spiritual decisions. These are nights where we have to make commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Commitment to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The azar that we perform of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, they are the launch pad. They are the base from which we take our journey. We start that journey. We need that kick 
that will be able to take us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That launch pad is the Adha of Aba Abdullah. Do the Adha of Aba Abdullah. An Adha as a means to getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose of this Muharram. That is the purpose of this Muharram. You know, there is a famous writer of the Hanafi school of thought for our brothers, you know, in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You know, his name is Al Qundusi. You know, he narrates this particular hadith. He narrates a tradition from Abu Dhar. And Abu Dhar basically narrates this from the Holy Prophet. And the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, he says that, Inna mathala ahlu bayti fikum mathala safinatun nu. He says, Man raqibaha naja wa man takhallafa anha halak. The Holy Prophet says that the similitude, the similarity of my progeny for you is just like the Ark of Noah. The Ark of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. And he says, the Holy Prophet said that whoever boards this Ark will be saved. There is salvation for that person who boards the Ark of the Ahlul Bayt. And for those who lag behind, they are going to perish just as those who lagged behind, who were not able to get onto the ark of Noah, they perished. This is the Holy Prophet's hadith. A companion came to our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And he said to our sixth Imam, he said, Tell me that Al Hussein is the lamp of guidance. Al Hussein is the lamp of guidance. Are you also all not also the lamp of guidance through which there is salvation like the Ark of Noah based on this particular hadith? Look at the response of the sixth Imam. The sixth Imam says to this companion, Kulluna sufunun najat illa an safinat al Hussein. And he says, Wasa'u. He says, all of us, there is no doubt, all of us are the arcs of salvation like the ark of Prophet Nu, except for the ark of Hussein. It is more spacious and it is faster. We have to take Al Hussein. We have to use Imam Hussein in these nights and make our spiritual decisions and commitments so that we can gain, gain proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a beautiful ayah in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam ya'na lil amanu an taqsha quloobuhum bi sikrillah. Allahu Akbar. What a pleasurable ayat this is, eh? Allah in the Quran says, Alam ya'na lil ladina bi izni, Alam ya'na lil ladina amanu an taqsha quloobuhum li dhikrillah. Allah says in the Quran, has the time not come that you should change? Allahu Akbar. Allah is saying it. Has the time not come that you should change? How many Muharrams do you want from me? How many Aza are you going to perform? Has the time not come that you should change? Allah is asking. In the Quran. You know, there was a man by the name of Fuzail ibn Ayas. Fuzail ibn Ayas, he was a Daku. He was a Dakuite. We call them Daku still? Not that Daku that you have in Ramadan. Eh? It's different. He was a tyrant, right? He was a thief. Right? He used to steal. He used to rob. He was one of those Dakuites. And what happens is that he was so feared... He was so feared that whatever he said he would do, he always did it. He had that reputation. If Fuzail says, I'm going to rob you tonight, and he used to openly say to people, hey, I'm going to rob you tonight. And if Fuzail says he's going to rob you, he's going to rob you. That was his reputation. People were scared of him. 
One day he was walking the streets of Medina. And as he was walking the streets of Medina, he saw a beautiful young woman. When he saw this beautiful young woman, he came to this woman and he said to this woman that, Look, I'm going to come to your house tonight. Tell your parents that either they have a choice. Either they marry you to me tonight or I'm going to kidnap you and take you away. Fuzail ibn Ayyaz. So this woman, you know, she got scared. She went home. She told her parents, I met Fuzail ibn Ayyaz. He came to me and this is what he said. And the parents became scared and said, if Fuzail has said this, then surely he's going to do it tonight. Surely he will do it. The night came and Fuzail, as he had intended, he went towards the house of this young woman, either to marry him or to take her away and kidnap him. As he was going and entering that house, he heard somebody recite the Holy Quran. And that person who was reciting the Holy Quran was reciting this ayah. أَلَمْ يَعْنَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَقْشَى قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has the time not come that you should change? And when Fuzair heard this, the ayah of the Qur'an pierced his heart. There has to have been some level of morality in the heart of Fuzair. That this ayah pierced the heart of Fuzair. And Fuzair stopped there and for a moment he thought, and he said to himself, why not? It is time for me to change. Why not? Indeed, it is time for me to change. Fuzail, you know, uh, stopped where he was. He turned around and he walked away. He then went and he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sins that he had committed. History tells us for several years, nobody knew where Fuzail ibn Ayyas was. He got lost. Until after a few years, Fuzail ibn Ayyas was seen with somebody. Fuzail ibn Ayyas was seen as one of the prominent companions of our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi If Fuzail can change, why not us? If Fuzail can change, then why not us? You know, the story of Jundab ibn Junada. You know who Jundab is? Jundab ibn Junada is Abu Zar. His name was Jundab ibn Junada. He used to be, you know, uh, a guy who used to take hafta. Yeah? You know, you take, you know, the bylogs these days, you know, they take hafta. So what he used to do is that if you were traveling, if you were a traveler, he would take money from you and in return he would guarantee your security that nobody will rob you. Hafta. Junda ibn Junada. It happened that once he heard, somebody told him that, do you know, there is a man in Makkah. There is a man in Makkah who is talking about one God. He is talking about the fact that he is the prophet of God. And he is saying this and he is saying that. And Jundab ibn Junada said to this man, he said, who is this guy? And the guy said, his name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. So Jundab ibn Junada, he got curious. And he says, I better go and see who this man is. Eh? So he goes to Makkah. Now the situation politically in Makkah was so tense when the Prophet had announced his prophethood that nobody wanted to associate with the Prophet. Eh? <coughs> nobody wanted to associate. Sometimes it happens to us, right? If somebody speaks the truth, we don't want to be associated with that person. Eh? Somebody who says the truth, we don't want to be associated with ah, bana problem tejase, bana business ma problem tejase, ama problem tejase, dur revano, that's it. Iena raste, umara raste. 
right? So nobody wanted to, he used to ask people, where is Muhammad? Where is Muhammad? And nobody would say anything. So we don't know, uh, we don't, yes, we have heard of him, we don't know. Finally, he saw a man walking. He went to this man, and this man was Amirul Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu And he asked Amirul Mu'mineen, and Imam Ali alayhi salam said to him, Jandab, come with me, I will take you to him. And the history writes that Jundab ibn Junada entered and spoke to the Prophet for how long, I don't know. But it appears that it was Jundab who entered and had a meeting with the Prophet. A few minutes later, the person who came out was Abu Zar. In fact, he came out, he did not waste time in that heated political environment. He immediately went to the Kaaba, he held the Kaaba and he did his Shahada in the Kaaba immediately. In that tense political situation. If he can change, why not us? Why not? Huh? Why not us? These are the nights, my friends, we have to see Imam Hussein. We have to feel the presence of Imam Hussein. This is the personality that changes destinies on these nights. He changed the destiny of 72 people in one night. He changed their destinies in one night. And all we do is we just look at our rituals. We do not use Abba Abdullah to come out from darkness into enlightenment. He changes the destiny. Look at how he changes the destiny of Hor. Eh? In one night, Hor comes out from darkness to light in one night. Abba Abdullah changes the destiny of Hor in one night. Look at how he changes destiny of people. Look at Zuhair ibn Cain. You know, Zuhair ibn Cain, he used to believe that Imam Ali alayhi salam was responsible for helping the killers of the third Khalifa, Osman. And so Zuhair ibn Cain, his caravan used to be traveling at the same time that Imam Hussein's caravan was traveling, yeah? From Makkah. When Imam Hussein was going towards Iraq, his caravan was traveling at the same time. But Zuhair ibn Kain knew, even though he had, you know, he had thought that Imam Ali was helping the killers of Osman, he, he knew the status of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He had some ma'rifah of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He was embarrassed, so he would always wait. He would not want to get too close to the caravan. He did not want to be able to have to talk to Imam Hussein. He thought he would be embarrassed. So he would avoid Imam Hussein. Until they come to a point where they had to camp at that site together. Because it was one of the water holes where they had to fill up water. Abu Zuhair ibn Kain, he camps a little bit further away from Imam Hussein's camp. So that he still would not have to. Talk to Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He is now in his tent. He is taking his dinner. He is about to put a spoonful of food in his mouth when somebody enters the tent of Zuhair ibn Kain. And this person was the messenger of Imam Hussein. And this person says to Zuhair ibn Kain, Oh Zuhair, the grandson of the Holy Prophet has called you to come and see him. Zuhair is going to take some food in his mouth. He looks at the food, he puts it on the plate. And he bows his head down. He doesn't know what to say. His wife, who's sitting next to him, says to Zuhair, Zuhair, what's the problem? Why are you hesitating to go and meet with the son of Fatima al-Zahra? He is the son of Fatima al-Zahra. Go and meet him. What have you got to lose? Go and meet him. Zuhair, sometimes we don't realize how great a role the women folk have played in the whole event of Karbala. Huh? At that time, Zuhair ibn Qayn gets up. He goes and he meets with Abba Abdullah al-Hussein. 
history tells us that Zuhair ibn Cain enters the tent of Aba Abdullah. The meeting takes place only for a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes. But the Zuhair that went into the tent and the Zuhair that came out of that tent were two different people. Why? Because Aba Abdullah took him from Zulumat to Noor. Why are we oblivious of this? Why aren't we using Imam Hussein salam, to take us from Zulumat to Noor? You know, I tell you, this Imam, look at the scene, what we learn from him. Eh? Look at the scene. <coughs> this Imam, he's on his last you know, few moments on the day of Ashura. Think about this. He has just sacrificed Ali Asghar in his hands. And he goes to Ummar Rubab. And he is now digging a grave behind his tent with his sword. And Ummar Rubab is holding the dead corpse of her young six month old baby. And Hussein is digging a grave. Hussein is digging a grave. Ummar Rubab is holding the corpse of Ali Asghar. And as Hussein is digging a grave, he is saying something. He is mumbling something. He is praying something. What does Hussein say? He says, Oh my Lord, I come to Ayali Likai Araq. He says that, Oh Lord, I have orphaned my children so that I may be able to come and see you. Allahu Akbar. I have orphaned my children so that I may be able to come and see you. And then he says that if they cut me into small pieces, irban irba, if they cut me into small pieces, then I will still not long or yearn for anyone else other than you, O oh Allah. Aba Abdullah al Hussein. You know, on the day of Ashura, we will do an amal, yeah? We do amal here, yeah? On the day of Ashura. And in this amal, you will see that one of the articles of the amal is you will walk seven times forward and you will come back seven times and you will recite, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, rizani bi qazaihi wa tasliman li amri. Right? You'll be reciting that, right? Seven times you'll walk forward and seven times you'll come back. Ever wondered why? You know, so many things happened in Karbala. Eh? There were so many events in Karbala. This particular amal that we do is the sunnah of Imam Hussein, right? This is the sunnah of Imam Hussein when he took the body of Ali Asghar in his hands and he walked towards the tent seven times and he retreated back from the tent seven times reciting inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We replicate the sunnah of Imam in the amal of Ashura. Ever thought why this amal? So many other things happened in Ashura. We could have picked something else. Our Imams could have picked something else. Why have they picked this one? The reason is, there is a symbolic message in this particular amal. Imam Hussein is holding his sacrifice, his six-month-old baby, and he is taking his sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. The reason we do this amal is because the message for us is, who is your sacrifice this Muharram? Who is your Ali Asghar this Muharram? What are you going to sacrifice this Muharram? That is the message of Abba Abdullah. That is what he wants to know. Who is going to commit not performing an act in the disobedience of Allah that we are currently performing? That is a sacrifice you can give. And on the day of Ashura, when you do that amal, take the courage and make the commitment. I will not perform this act anymore that I was performing. This is my sacrifice, this Muharram. If you do that, wallah, you have done the azar of Aba Abdullah. Who is your Ali Asghar? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abdi khalaktul ashya'a li ajli. He says that, O oh, my servant, I have created this dunya for you. I have created this entire dunya for you. Wa khalaktuka li ajli. But you I have created for myself. We have reversed this, eh? We have flipped it. We think that the dunya is not created for us, that we are created for the dunya. And because of that, we go after it in constant pursuit of it. This is why Abu Abdullah al Hussein in Dwaya Arafah he says, Mada wajada man faqadak. He says to Allah, he says, Oh Allah, the one who lost you, what did he find? And the one who found you, what did he lose? Aba Abdullah al Hussein. You know, Fazl Nurakhi, he mentions, you know, in his book, Mi'raj Sada. It's an incident between Zulaikha and Yusuf. You know, Zulaikha was madly in love with Yusuf, eh? you know that. So she had madly in love with Yusuf. You know, inshallah, I'm writing a book on Zulaikha. From apparent to essence. Pray for me, inshallah, that we are able to complete that book. This is looking at just Zulaikha and her journey. So Zulaikha is madly in love with Yusuf, yeah? That comes a time when Zulaikha becomes really old and she becomes really frail and she's even lost her eyesight. Yusuf now has become the king of Egypt, right? He's the second in command. He has the whole finance, the minister of finance. He has everything under his control. Zulaikha has become old and frail and blind. Yusuf is in charge now, is the king. As once Yusuf was on his horse and he was riding the streets in Egypt and he saw Zulaikha, Zulaikha was sitting on the side. Zulaikha was sitting on the side. So Yusuf stopped. Yusuf stopped and he looked at Zulaikha. Zulaikha was old, she was blind. Eh? She was blind, but she could smell the aroma of Yusuf. She knew that Yusuf had stood there, right? And when Yusuf looked at Zulaikha, he asked Zulaikha a question. He said, Zulaikha, you still love me? Same love? Same passion that you had? Fazal Naraki writes in his book, eh? Miraj Usad, I'm giving you a reference tomorrow. Don't say, Amitani Suboli, you kabar nafi kyan hile ewoto. Right? So then what happens is Yusuf asks this question, same passion, same love. At that time, Zulaikha gets up. She takes hold of her stick, her cane, and takes support of her cane and gets up. And she goes and she gets hold of the reins of the horse of Yusuf. And she just says, oh Yusuf. And Fazal Narahi writes that the reins of the horse of Yusuf heated up because of the love of Zulaikha for Yusuf. Then what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Zulaikha by a miracle. He gives her her youth back. He gives her her eyesight back. Zulaikha becomes young again. And Allah orders Yusuf to marry Zulaikha. Now Zulaikha is married to Yusuf. Eh? What happens? Now when Yusuf comes home, is after the minister of finance, right? So after he comes home, after a hard day's work, it's tough, man, hard day's work. You come home, you want to relax a little bit. He comes home, he looks, Zulaikha is on the musalla. Okay, no problem. So this comes every day, this happens. He comes home, Zulaikha is on the musalla, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day Yusuf says to Zulaikha, Zulaikha, when, when you were young, 
you had that love and that passion for me. Now I come home and you are on the musalla worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zulaikha looks at Yusuf and says, Oh Yusuf, you are the prophet of Allah. It is through you that you have taken me from zulumat to nur. Before I was in love with your beauty, but through you I have realized that the true beauty is in that creator who created the beauty in you. That is why I worship him every day. That is why I worship him every day. You have taken me from Zulumat to Noor. This is why I worship him every day. You see, the worship of a person who has a ma'arifa of Allah is a very different worship. Eh? It's a very different worship. Dhamani waqt mein gunjaish nahi ho, mera waqt khatam ho gaya hai. Allama Iqbal kehte hai, ke khudi ko kar buland itna, ke har takdeer se pehle, khuda bande se khud puche ke bata teri raza kya hai. Huh? Create your own destiny. Khuda bande se khud puche ke bata teri raza kya hai. Is liye to Amir al-Mu'mineen wo kya kehna wo imam ka hai. Mawlai kainat kehte hai ma abadduka khalqan min narik. O Allah, imam kehte hai ke ee mere khuda, ee mere parwardigar, meinne teri jahannam ki khauf mein teri ibadat nahi ki hai. تیرے جہنم کی خوف میں میں نے تیری عبادت نہیں کی ہے وَلَا تَنْحَرْ مِن جَنَّتِكْ نہ ہی میں نے تیری جنت کی لالچ میں تیری عبادت کی ہے تیرے جہنم کی خوف میں میں نے تیری عبادت نہیں کی ہے نہ ہی تیرے جنت کی لالچ میں میں نے تیری عبادت کی ہے تو امیر المؤمنین آپ نے عبادت کیوں کی ہے بَلْ وَجَدْتُكَ أَحْلًا لِلْعِبَادِكَ بَعْدَتْ امام کہتے ہیں کہ میں نے تجھے عبادت کے قابل سمجھا ہے اس لیے تیرا سجدہ کیا ہے تجھے عبادت کے قابل سمجھا اس لیے میں نے تمہارا سجدہ کیا اور وہ سجدہ الگ ہوتا ہے وہ دل کا سجدہ ہوتا ہے وہ سجدہ جو معرفت کے ساتھ ہوتا ہے وہ الگ سجدہ ہوتا ہے وہ دل کا سجدہ ہوتا ہے علامہ رشید ترابی کہتے ہیں کیا بات کیے اس نے علامہ رشید ترابی کہتے ہیں کہ جو ایک کا سجدہ نہیں کرتا وہ ہر ایک کا سجدہ کرتا ہے کیا گہرائی ہے اس بات میں جو ایک کا سجدہ نہیں کرتا وہ ہر ایک کا سجدہ کرتا ہے اور اللہ نے تجھے پیشانی دی ہے اور بلند دی ہے تاکہ تُو جھک لیکن اس کے سامنے جھک جس نے تجھے پیشانی دی ہے ہم ہیں ہمارا سجدہ کچھ اور چیزوں کے لیے ہوتا ہے ہم پجاری ہو گئے پجاری اے پجاری ہم کبھی دولت کے سامنے اپنا سر جھکا دیتے ہیں کبھی شہرت کے سامنے ہم اپنا سر جھکا دیتے ہیں کبھی اپنی اولاد کی سہولیت کے سامنے اپنا سر جھکا دیتے ہیں اللہ کہتا ہے تمہیں سجدہ کرنا ہے میرا سجدہ کرو پھر دیکھو میں تمہیں ظلمات سے نور تک کیسے لے جاتا ہوں امیر المؤمنین کہتا ہے الہی انتا کما اوری اوی میرے معبود تو ویسا خدا ہے جیسا میں چاہتا تھا پھر امام کہتے ہیں فَجَعَلْنِي كَمَا تُرِيد اب مجھے ایسا بندہ بنا دے جیسا تو چاہتا ہے امیر المؤمنین عزیزان اگرامی یہ کھربلا کا میسج ہے یہ پیغام عبا عبداللہ ہے اپنے دل کی اندر کچھ چینجز لانے کی ضرورت ہے کچھ ٹرانسفورمیشن کی ضرورت ہے محرم میں یہ میسج ہے اب عبداللہ الحسین امام حسین نے سب کچھ خوشندی الہی کے لیے قربان کر دیا ہمارے لیے سوال ہے کہ امام نے تو سب کچھ قربان کر دیا ہم نے کیا کیا ہم کیا کرنے والے ہیں محرم جب مدینہ سے روانہ ہو رہے تھے تو زینب ایک مرتبہ عبداللہ بن جعفر تیار کے پاس آتی ہے 
اور جناب زینب نے عبداللہ بن جعفر تیار کو کہا کہ میں حسین ماجا حسین کے ساتھ جانا چاہتی ہوں عبداللہ بن جعفر تیار نے زینب سے کہا ایک منٹ ٹھہر جاؤ کچھ دیر کے لیے ٹھہر جاؤ عبداللہ بن جعفر تیار گھر کے اندر گئے اپنے دو بچوں کو ساتھ لے کے آئے باہر کہتے ہیں زینب اگر حسین کے ساتھ جا رہے ہو تو اگر ایسا وقت آیا تو اون کو میری طرف سے قربان کر دینا اور محمد کو تمہاری طرف سے قربان کر دینا قربان ہوئے ہیں ہمارے بچے کربلا کے میدان میں ہم نے کون سی قربانی دی ہے اب وہ وقت آتا ہے کہ زینب اونٹ پہ سوار ہونے والی ہے جب بھی کوئی بی بی سوار ہوتی تھی تو کبھی قاسم آ جاتے تھے سوار کرنے کے لیے کبھی علی اکبر آ جاتے تھے سوار کرنے کے لیے کبھی ابو الفضل عباس آ جاتے تھے سوار کرنے کے لیے لیکن اب جب زینب کی باری آئی ہے تو ایک مرتبہ قاسم آگے بڑھے کہاں پھوپھی اما آپ مجھ میرا سہارا لے کے سوار ہو جائیے زینب نے انکار کیا علی اکبر آگے بڑھے پھوپھی اما اکبر زہ آپ کو سوار کر دے گا زینب نے انکار کیا ابو الفضل عباس آگے بڑھتے ہیں کہتے ہیں بہن زینب ابو الفضل عباس آپ کو سوار کرے گا زینب نے ان کار کیا جب اب عبد اللہ حسین نے یہ منظر دیکھا ہے ایک مرتبہ اب عبد اللہ آگے پر ہے کہا بہن زینب اب عبد اللہ حسین آج خود آپ کو سوار کرے گا میں کہتا ہوں کہ شاید یہ وہی منظر تھا کہ شام غریبہ کو جب سب بی بیوں کو زینب نے سوار کیا تھا تب شاید زینب کو یہ منظر یاد آ گیا ہوگا شاید زینب نے آواز دی ہوگی کہ ارے قاسم اب کہا ہو پھپی اممہ کو سوار کرنے کے لیے آ جاؤ علی اکبر تم کہا ہو پھپی اممہ کو سوار کرنے کے لیے آ جاؤ یہ باما جائے حسین تم کہا ہو زینب سوار کرنے کے لیے تیار ہے میں کہوں گا بی بی سب کو آواز دینا لیکن غازی عباس کو آواز نہ دے اگر غازی نے آپ کی آواز سن لی تو نہر فرات میں غازی کی لاش ترپ جائے گی اور نہر فرات میں ایک زلزلہ آ جائے گا ازاداروں یہ دوسری محرم کو یہ کافلہ ایک جگہ پہنچتا ہے جناب زینب نے امام الحسین سے کہا کہ ما جائے یہ جگہ کونسی ہے یہاں مجھے بہت بہچینی ہو رہی ہے تم حکم کرو کہ ہم یہاں سے جلدی نکل جائے اب عبداللہ الحسین نے زہیر ابن کین کو بلایا کہاں زہیر ذرا پتہ چلو پتہ کرو کہ یہ جگہ کونسی ہے کیونکہ اب عبداللہ الحسین کا گھوڑا اب آگے نہیں بڑھ رہا ہے ایک وہی جگہ پہ اٹکا ہوا ہے امام نے کہا زہیر ذرا پتہ کرو کہ یہ جگہ کا نام نام کیا ہے زہر ایک شخص کو لے کے آتا ہے ایک شخص کو لے کے آتا ہے اسے پوچھا گیا وہ شخص کہتا ہے کہ آقا اسے ساحل الفرات کہتے ہیں امام نے کہا کہ اس کا کوئی اور نام ہے کہا کہ اس کو فلاں کہتے ہیں کہا کہ اس کا کوئی اور نام ہے کہا اس کو یہ کہتے ہیں کہا کوئی اور نام ہے وہ شخص کہتا ہے آقا اس کو نئی نوا بھی کہتے ہیں امام نے کہا کوئی اور نام تو ہوگا کوئی اور نام بتاؤ اب وہ وہ شخص کہتا ہے آقا اس زمین کو کرب و بلا کہتا ہے اس زمین کو کرب و بلا کہتے ہیں یہ سننا تھا امام گھوڑے سے زمین پہ آئے زہر ابن کین کو لیا کہا زہر میرے ساتھ چلو ایک جگہ پہ لے گئے کہا زہر اس جگہ کو دیکھو یہاں میرے قاسم کے لاش کو بھامال کیا جائے گا ایک دوسری جگہ پہ گئے کہا زہر یہاں میرے علی اکبر کے سینے میں برچی لگے گی ایک اور جگہ پہ لے گئے کہا 
ذرا دیکھو زہر یہاں میرے عباس کے بازو شہید ہو جائیں گے پھر امام ایک جگہ پہ آتے ہیں زمین پہ بیٹھ گئے کہا زہر یہ وہ جگہ ہے جہاں میرے چھے ماں کا ننالی اسگر اسے قتل اور زباہ کیا جائے گا ازاداروں امام نے اس زمین کو خریدا اس زمین کو خریدا اور بنو اسد کے لوگ جو وہاں موجود کے ان لوگوں کو اکھٹا کیا کہا دیکھو یہ بہت ممکن ہے کہ کچھ دنوں کے بعد ہم یہاں شہید ہو جائیں گے ہو سکے تو ہمیں دفن کر دینا ہمیں کفن دے دینا اور ہمیں دفن کر دینا پھر عجیب بات کہیں امام نے عورتوں کو جمع کیا جب عورتوں کو جمع کیا امام نے عورتوں کو کہا کہ دیکھو یہ ممکن ہے کہ تمہارے شوہر تمہارے مرد جو ہے یزید کی ظلم سے در جائے اگر ایسا ہو تو تم اسرار کرنا کہ ہمیں دفن کیا جائے اور ہمیں کفن مل جائے پھر ایک عجیب بات کہی امام نے بچوں کو دیکھا سب بچے بنو اسد کے کھیل رہے تھے بچوں کو ایک مرتبہ اکھٹا کیا امام زمین کربلا پہ بیٹھ گئے اب بچوں کو کہا ہائے میرا مظلوم امام بچوں کو کہتے ہیں کہ دیکھو بچوں یہ ممکن ہے کہ تمہارے ماں اور باپ یزید کے ظلم سے ڈر جائے اگر ایسا ہو اور تم ہماری لاشوں کو دیکھو تو اپنے ہاتھ میں ایک مٹھی کھاک اٹھانا اور کھیلتے کھیلتے ہماری لاشوں پہ ڈال دینا تاکہ ہمیں دفن مل جائے وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلِمُوا أَيَّا مِنْ قَلْبِ يَنْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُون